It's my sad task to welcome you to Rockefeller Chapel today for this ceremony at which we honor Greg Hillhouse, dearly loved colleague, professor, and friend. It's a ceremony that has come too soon by our judgment. We were not ready to lose Greg, and it seems to us that we lost him too quickly, too unexpectedly, without the farewells that we would have wanted to say. And with that, we come together today to say the things about Greg that we've been wanting to say, to honor and celebrate his great cheerful presence among us, and to mourn his death. Along with his friends, Greg's close friend, Surrey Walton, and his family, representing his life beyond the university. We gather in this space where we celebrate the great joys of the academy and where we also confront our losses, where we shed tears of joy and also of sorrow. The order of our ceremony today is simple. Some remembrances offered by members of the chemistry department and by others chosen from among Greg's many friends and colleagues throughout the university. There will be two musical interludes with the only music that Greg would have tolerated for this event, that of the Grateful Dead. During the music, I invite you to focus your thoughts where you will, to give thanks for Greg's extraordinary life and being, perhaps to meditate upon life's fragility and impermanence or to remember particular moments, moments of inspiration and delight, moments of laughter and tears spent with Greg, or simply to love that mellow music of Jerry Garcia that accompanied Greg on his own journey. Professor Rich Jordan, chair of the department and longtime colleague and friend of Greg's, is going to lead us into our reflections upon Greg's life and larger than life presence among us. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, very happy that so many of you are here to participate in this memorial service for our friend and colleague, Greg Hillhouse. Um, as you know, Greg was a professor in our department and in the college for 32 years. Uh, and in my view, he was a pillar of excellence in the university. Uh, he was a world-class researcher, a wonderful teacher and mentor to his students, an engaged citizen of the university, and in my view, a quiet, behind-the-scenes leader in the university community. And in these various roles, he touched the lives of, of all of you and many others uh, at the university. Uh, this afternoon, as we hear from a small selection of the students and faculty and administrators with whom Greg worked over the years, I think a beautiful picture of his uh, many contributions and the qualities that um, he expressed as a person will emerge. And so I'm very happy that all of you are here to participate. My own interactions with Greg go back roughly 30 years to when we were both new assistant professors trying to make our mark in inorganic chemistry. I had the good fortune of becoming his colleague when I moved to Chicago about 15 years ago. And during the past few years, as I've tried to avoid the chairman's office, um, I've had the opportunity to work with Greg on many, many different issues and look to him for advice on many other issues, uh, particularly those relating to students and teaching. Um, Greg was clearly a very complex person, as we all are. Uh, but for me, one word captures the essence of his character. And that word is integrity. Integrity is the quality of being honest and fair and having strong moral principles. Integrity means that you not only talk the talk, you walk the walk. And I think that captures Greg. Uh, in my dealings with him, 
over many, many years, I found him to be a totally honest person. He could play political games with the best of them, but he chose not to. Uh, he always told you exactly what he felt. If he agreed with you, he would say so. If he disagreed with you, if he thought you were full of bunk, and in the sin of all sins, if he thought you were putting your own narrow interests ahead of those of the department or the students, he would let you know immediately and directly uh, with whatever emphasis was needed to make sure you understood what he was trying to say. He always tried to do the right thing and not the expedient thing. And I think all of us in the chemistry department and in other units um, within the university valued his counsel because we knew that he would always try to do what was best for the university and in particular for the students, not what was best for him. Um, of course, there are a million Greg Hillhouse stories, and I have my share, uh, but we're in a cathedral, so I should probably skip most of them. And I thought I would just mention one short, not even an anecdote, just a snippet of an anecdote, dealing with all things uh, my computer. So in my role as chairman, I've had the uh, pleasure, let's say, of dealing with all of the faculty on many, many issues. And so I was necessary to um, put a file on my computer named Chairman Stuff, and there's another file within that file named Faculty, and within that there are a series of sub-files, sub one for each, sub-folders, one for each faculty member. And earlier this year, uh, after Greg got sick, I had the, uh, uh, it was necessary for me to save a document relating to how we were going to deal with uh, his teaching duties after he was unable to continue. And I went to save it, and I realized that I didn't have a Hill House faculty file. And it, it just blew me away. So I've been working with the guy for 15 years, almost daily. And in all that time, I never had the, the necessity to save anything in writing. Because I knew if Greg said he was going to do something, he would do it. I knew that he would keep any commitments that he made to me or any agreements that we made. And if he felt it was necessary to, to break an agreement, I knew he would come tell me. That's what integrity is, and I think this is what is really the, the foundation of the University of Chicago. Um, now, I wanted to just make two quick administrative announcements. Um, first, uh, uh, as you know, after Greg passed away, the department wanted to do something permanent to honor his, leg his legacy, uh, not only because he was our friend and our colleague but we felt that it was important that the future students and faculty within the department became aware of uh, the qualities that Greg embodied and hopefully would, would assimilate those qualities. And so with this goal in mind, we've set up the Gregory L. Hillhouse Chemistry Undergraduate Fund uh, to support uh, various undergraduate activities. And in particular, this fund will support the Hillhouse Lectureship which will be run by the undergraduates who will uh, invite and host the speakers. And the fund will also support undergraduate uh, summer research for our chem majors. Uh, and if you'd like to make a donation to this fund, which I hope you will, then you can go to the chemistry department website for instructions. And the, uh, your donation will be leveraged by a two to one match provided by the chemistry department. And finally, I invite all of you to attend the reception that will follow this service uh, at the Quadrangle Club, uh, starting at 5.30, which will be about when this service will finish. And I think it'll be a great time to uh, wipe, our, wipe our eyes, dry our eyes, I'm sure, and reminisce about our friend over a glass of wine or maybe several glasses of wine. Thank you. Greg Hillhouse and I both came to the university in the same year, 1983. Although I came as a member of the Astronomy and Astrophysics Department, and he joined the Department of Chemistry, we did share something deep, something in common, a love of competitive basketball. Greg and I both gave up basketball for the same reason. Once you reach your 50s, the basket seems higher, the court seems longer, others seem faster, 
And no matter how many ibuprofen you take, you can't fool your knees into thinking that you are still 25 years old. Basketball, in particularly, in particularly competitive basketball, teaches many things. One thing it teaches is that different people have different talents. Some people can shoot, some rebound, some are amazing in the dribble penetration, some have the natural court vision of a point guard, some people are great passers, Personally, I never like to pass the ball, but I could admire a great pass, especially if it came to me. On every team, different teammates contribute in different ways and in different degrees. But the most valuable player is not the person who is the leading scorer or the best rebounder or even the one with the most assists. The most valuable player contributes in a way not apparent in the box score of the game or in the season statistics. The rarest and most valuable ability in basketball is the ability to make your teammates better, to elevate the games of others. It is a rare player who brings out the best in others. It's a sort of magic that can't be explained, but sometimes a team is just better when a certain person is on the court. More often than not, that person is the difference between a championship team and a team of equally talented individuals who just can't seem to win it all. Greg brought out the best in his basketball teammates and he brought out the best in his chemistry colleagues. Some of Greg's many, many contributions to the science of chemistry, the department of chemistry, and the university will be recounted by others. Greg's research, teaching, mentoring, and service to the department, the division, and the university have been acknowledged over the years by many awards and recognitions. Excellence in research by the American Chemical Society Award in his field. Teaching excellence by the Quantrell Award. And service to the university by the Starkley Duncan Award and the Norman McLean Faculty Alumni Award, to name just a few. But there is no award for the magic of making your colleagues better. The department, the division, and the university were simply better because Greg was on the court with us. He had the magic touch to elevate the game of his colleagues. He didn't do it by yelling or cajoling, but by example. Over time, others in the chemistry department will pick up the pieces left behind by Greg's passing. There will continue to be distinguished research, exceptional teaching, and meritorious service. Even though I can't imagine a single individual having the impact in so many areas as Greg, somehow the department will go on and continue to do great things. The real challenge to the chemistry department, indeed to every department, is to find people like Greg who make everyone around them better. I challenge his colleagues to remember how Greg elevated everyone's game and to strive to bring out the best not just in yourself, but in your colleagues as well. It's so sad that Greg has left the court so early. But Greg's spirit is still here. Let us honor Greg by dedicating ourselves to finding and mentoring colleagues who will fill his shoes. Greg's devotion to students is legendary. 
He gave students advice that was honest, sometimes brutally honest, but students always knew that he had their best interests at heart. Indeed, his communications with me were the same, honest and respectful, collegial in the best sense, but always to the point. Most people don't know that Greg served six years from 2002 to 2008 as a member of the College Discipline Committee. For three of these years, he chaired the committee. The committee chair is responsible for conducting the hearings according to our policies with gravitas and with fairness. These hearings are serious, often sad occasions with students who have sometimes made grave errors. Though the committee is required to impose sanctions that uphold our institutional values, the group always considers themselves to be educators with a focus on the eventual positive outcome for each student. I remember one case that was particularly sad in which a young person had got herself into a considerable amount of trouble by stealing from other students. It became clear in the course of the hearing that this student had almost no resources, no friends to rely on, no family support, no money. Further, she had very low self-esteem. The committee strongly recommended that, in addition to the sanction they imposed, she received counseling over a period of time. After the hearing, Greg called me to say that he'd like to contribute anonymously to the expense of her therapy and made arrangements to provide the college with money that could be used for this purpose. To me, this memory captures Greg's essential character. He always upheld his institutional roles with students as undergraduate advisor, lab director, professor, discipline committee chair, but he also saw each student's humanity and put himself in the service of supporting what is essentially good and promising in each person. He will always be to me the model of an excellent citizen of this university. My name is Brian Baldea. <clears throat> I'm Associate Director of Athletics and Head Baseball Coach here at the University. I'm honored to represent the Department of Physical Education and Athletics and our many student athletes at this service. Greg Hillhouse was a true friend and supporter of athletics and student athletes here. For many of us, he was a familiar face at our events and a valued advocate for our programs. Many of you know that Greg was selected for the Starkey Duncan Award in 2009 in recognition of his devotion to student athletes and athletics here at UChicago. Starkey Duncan, a professor in psychology and a leading researcher here at the university, served as our faculty athletic representative to the NCAA for more than 20 years. After his passing in 2007, the Duncan Award was created to honor a faculty or staff member who provided long-term service to intercollegiate athletics through active participation and leadership. Only three individuals have been given this honor since its inception. It's a special award. Greg Hillhouse was a special man, and he made our student athletes feel special. At the banquet where he received the Starkey Duncan Award, Greg made them feel special by, from the podium, telling them, I'm in awe of what you do. Included among the many student athletes influenced by Greg over the years are two of my current baseball players. These two have fond recollections of softball, golf, and lunch with G, as they called him. They relied on his advice when selecting classes, creating presentations, applying for study abroad programs, and just in general navigating the college. So Greg's care and assistance went far beyond chemistry. These players refer to him as mentor, but they also refer to him as close friend. One of our wrestlers during his second year in the college decided to concentrate in chemistry and faced the monumental task of handling four courses, working in Greg's lab, and competing in wrestling at the same time. <clears throat> he thought that a bit too much, so he dropped off the wrestling team. When Greg learned this, he pulled the student into his office and told him, pointed out to him, that participating in intercollegiate athletics is a special experience available only to a few students, relatively. He said, you'll have the rest of your life to do chemistry, but wrestling is something you derive many benefits from, 
and something that you will not do after you leave here. That wrestler rejoined the team, competed for four years, did graduate work at MIT, and eventually earned his PhD in chemistry from Cal Berkeley. I understand that Greg's office is loaded with sports memorabilia and that he loved to talk to students about sports, from the Bulls to the White Sox to the Maroons. He wore his U Chicago Letterman's jacket all around the city, and he treasured the locker that we reserved for him in the Ratner Athletic Center as part of his Duncan Award. Greg Hillhouse was an ardent supporter who impacted the lives of many student athletes here. We will miss him. My words did glow with the gold of sunshine, and my tunes were played from the harp unstrung. Couldn't you hear my voice come through the music? Would you hold it near as it? To hand me down, the thoughts are broken. Perhaps they're better left unsung. I don't know, don't really care. Let there be songs. To fill the air, ripple in the still waters when there is no paddle toss, nor wind to blow. Reach out your hand if your cup be empty, if your cup. Is full, may it be again. Let it be known there is a fountain that was not made by the hands of man. Greg Hillhouse was one of my best friends. And now that I live in North Carolina, I always enjoyed hearing from him. At the end of January this year, Greg sent me an email entitled Confidential. Knowing Greg, the word confidential could mean an awful lot of things. However, after the Dear Jim, the word confidential took on a truly shocking meaning. I have some bad news, he wrote. I had tests earlier this week and found out Wednesday morning that I have inoperable pancreatic cancer. The news was hard for me to accept. It still is. Then he suddenly switched gears and informed me of my grandson's progress in his chemistry 201 class. Finally, Greg wrote, 
I hope to be able to continue to lecture as much as possible as I also enjoy teaching Chemistry 201 very much. This was typical of Greg. He was thinking about me, not himself, even though he was highly suffering at the time. Sadly, Greg's teaching very quickly came to an end. At most, he gave only one or two more lectures, three, I believe. Greg's life was lived to the fullest and provided many people with a lot of fun and humorous occasions. One of my most vivid memories of Greg was his frequent boast to me that he could make a living in three different fields. Of course, the first field was chemistry, and fortunately, he won the 2013 ACS Award for Organometallic Chemistry. Just before he was stricken down, the second area was basketball, which you've already heard about. I never saw Greg play for some reason. I have no idea why I didn't, and I can't judge his basketball skills. But as to how good he is or was in basketball, you could ask President Obama, who before becoming president played on the same university courts, knocking elbows, really hard elbows, with Greg. The third area was art. Greg painted. To explore his art, you needed to visit his home, where upon entering, you would see lovely cut flowers sitting in a vase in front of a painting of the same type of flowers. Greg's had a typical attention to detail. He had arranged for a florist to provide him with these flowers on a regular basis. Then Greg would serve you a fancy gourmet meal while at the same time bragging about how good a cook he was. However, when he would tell me that he could make a living as a chemist, a basketball player, or as an artist, I remained skeptical. But Greg never claimed to me that he could make a living as a chef. So now with hindsight, I think he could have become as successful in any one of these three areas that he boasted about. Greg loved this university a lot. Greg loved Chicago. Greg was an excellent departmental citizen, of which we've heard, and a very active university citizen. For sure, Gregory L. Hillhouse was a multi-talented, fun, generous, and thoughtful friend, and I will sadly miss getting Christmas cards signed, your pal, Greg. Greg came to Chicago as a junior faculty member in 1983, and I started graduate school in 85. Those were the days that Greg was still in lab, and he would brag to us about his hands touched by God. My research group and Greg's hung out together, and we pretty much grew up scientifically with Greg as a mentor. We all worked hard and we played hard, and Greg was there with us on both accounts. He taught us science, but he also taught us about life. For example, I learned how to eat with chopsticks at Thai 55 because Greg wouldn't let us use a fork. The first few times you went hungry, but you learned quickly. This is a classic example of some of Greg's tough love. Greg was extremely generous with his time, his knowledge, and his resources. He was a loyal mentor and friend to scores of graduate and undergraduate students throughout his 30-year career at Chicago. When I came back to Chicago for a career, Greg was doing his first stint as director of undergraduate studies in chemistry. And I worked closely with him, and I learned from him. He taught me how to write a solid letter of recommendation. Greg wrote the best letters. His second stint as chem advisor lasted eight years. 
It is a very time-consuming job for a faculty member, but he loved it and he excelled at it. He accomplished many things, but I will mention his latest very important accomplishment for our chem undergrads. It used to frustrate Greg to no avail that some of our undergrads were doing high-powered research in the summer or the academic year, but sometimes they could not fit the research courses into their program and thus their transcript would not reflect their effort. So, Greg came up with a compliment to Chem 299, our research course, that was non-credit and thus could be taken as a fifth course at any time and would reflect the student's research effort on their academic record. So Greg's most recent legacy is Chem 296 for our undergrads. Hill House was such an integral part of our departmental culture and such a unique and strong influence on all of us. He left us much too soon and much too quickly. He had so much more to give you, Chicago and the field of chemistry and his generosity would have ensured so many more gifts to all of us. However, he has left a substantial legacy in all of the students that he mentored throughout his life. And these students will pay forward all that we learned from Greg and thus his tremendous influence will be felt for many generations to come. Hill House, memory eternal. Well, I, uh, I knew Greg Hillhouse for about 35 years. We started uh, at Caltech uh, at about the same time, with just within just a few months of each other in 1980. And uh, he was a postdoc and I was a graduate student. We worked in different labs, one floor apart, but in those days, uh, all of the groups mixed together. Uh, we all hung out together and every Friday night we'd be down at the bar at the basement of the Athenaeum just like it is today at Caltech. And um, I, I think if you think about Greg and his personality and his zest for life, and then move back 35 years and imagine that with more energy and good knees, it was really something to behold. I, I mean, uh, it's, he, was, he, was, he was the way he remember him, but, but actually more so if you can imagine that. And as Rich alluded to, we all have our stories, uh, none of which really should or can be repeated. But if we collected them, I think, uh, all of us, we'd have a pretty interesting one-week symposium on uh, Greg's lessons of various ways to enjoy life. And it would be really wide-ranging, I think. One of the things that uh, was mentioned was that Greg would not be bashful about telling about his own uh, attributes and that was, that was certainly true at the time. He, uh, I remember one occasion, he, uh, Vera mentioned his hands touched by God. He came in and asked what I was working on, and I was a, he was a brilliant synthetic chemist, and I was a spectroscopist who was doing just enough synthetic chemistry to get by, and he, he said, well, gee, Mike, I'm sorry I've already made plans for the weekend. Uh, otherwise, I'd come in and I could finish your project for you, you know wrap the whole thing up, the whole rest of my PhD. <clears throat> I don't want to dwell on what made Greg fun and a, and, a, and a really interesting person to be around, but what made him a great human being, though. And uh, we talked, and everyone knows, about his deep commitment to students and the service that he did to the university. And we, we used the word service to collect as a term all of the things that are outside of research and teaching that we ask faculty to do that make the university a, a better place. And I don't think that's really an adequate term for Greg. There's a whole level beyond service and, and, and it was just that he was a, he didn't do service, he, he gave. He gave and he gave and he gave and he was deeply involved in the lives of students. He insisted 
that the university do the best for students and that and that they received in a superb education and that they left here not only not only with a great education but with their lives enriched by contact with faculty and I think the one anecdote I can t I can say that or I can tell that maybe captures this best is right at the end of uh, right at the end of his life um, on on the day he uh, was diagnosed I, I arrived in my office and I found that there was a voice message from him from very early in the morning and he uh, said uh, and I, I just listened to this before coming over uh, because uh, I can't I can't erase it uh, Mike I, I just got a call from my doctor and uh, I received uh, very bad news and uh, he then asked if I could fill in for him uh, in teaching chemistry 201 but he didn't stop there he said uh, Mike I'm gonna be teaching I'd like you to teach uh, the molecular orbitals of water um, if you could uh, perhaps uh, do it from a linear combination of atomic orbital basis, uh, go through uh, how that connects to the symmetry of the compound, and maybe you, it'd be interesting to contrast that with methane, where the S and P orbitals don't mix by symmetry. So here's someone who, really at the at the very moment of truth, where he's confronting his mortality in a way that I can't imagine, uh, not only thought that here was a lecture that he needed somebody to give today, but boy, it really needed to be a good lecture. These students really needed to hear the very best. And uh, all I can say is that uh, he's a, he was a remarkable man who I'll miss very much. And I think if we think back on what he did, it should inspire us all to always try to just give a little bit more. Um, to me, uh, Greg was a friend, uh, a mentor, and a colleague. Our friendship um, started um, in my last year of graduate school here, um, in the year 1998, which I think was a very memorable year to me in, in many respects, and very influential, I think, in my subsequent choice of my own academic career path. It was uh, several of my friends and I, um, um, I guess, would uh, hang out on the second floor of Searle and very often talk to uh, Greg and Bill Wolf, who shared uh, an office suite there and always welcomed uh, students, um, you know, to talk to. And those conversations, I think, were very influential, not just to me, but uh, several of other of my friends that also chose, I think, subsequently in academic careers as well. So I also remember um, actually getting my PhD degree in this fine cathedral and, and the dinner that we had after my PhD defense where it was mostly my friends and then we invited Greg to come with us um, and, um, and we went to Cafe 28 um, at a long um, a cheerful dinner and, and, uh, and then we realized that Greg insisted on paying the entire bill, you know, even though uh, we uh, had strong objections to that. But we couldn't convince him otherwise. This friendship continued when I came here as a faculty member in the year 2000. And um, I was uh, fortunate to uh, share in our an office suite with Greg um, as I took over the old um, office of Bill Wolf after he left our department. And we had many uh, memorable long conversations, uh, uh, awesome dinners, excellent bottles of wines that we shared uh, during those times. I think that I was the closest to Greg, I think. And it was also very important um, to sort of reflect, you know, we've, uh, we all know how supportive Greg is in so many ways, but he was really supportive also of every junior faculty hire that we have made, you know, including myself. And, you know, sometimes, you know, when you're an assistant professor, you hear people say that sometimes you don't want to remember the first couple of years of, the, of, of your career because those years tend to be sometimes hard when you're, you know, just getting from a transition, you know, into a transition from a postdoc to running your own lab. 
And I'm really uh, fortunate that I've uh, had the experience of, of having Greg by my side there, and, and uh, he was always there um, when I had to vent my frustrations and when I uh, had questions, and he always was generous sharing his own experiences and his own stories. And it was during those days that uh, I saw firsthand his amazing mentorship skills um, with undergraduate students, graduate students, and postdocs. Those skills that I still live up to to this day that always remind me what a true mentor I think is. And I'm sure we will hear more about it from um, actually his own former students who have become very successful in their own, uh, in their own academic careers. And uh, it was, uh, um, you know, really sad that um, I guess that, you know, this happened so, so fast that um, I remember that, you know, we, I used to uh, bring Greg, you know, caviar when I used to travel back home because he had an, as much of an appreciation for or a caviar as a Russian would. I also uh, brought him a couple of bottles of wine and one of them we shared in my office just a few months ago when I came back from Napa. You know, and, and those were all really memorable moments. So we already heard uh, how much Greg cared about um, students, uh, the department, and the university. And to me, um, in addition to the integrity that Rich talked about, I think there's two qualities that stand out in Greg as a colleague. Um, is his deep passion for science and his uh, highest level of scholarship. And those qualities were there until his last days. When I remember I visited him in the office and we had a long conversation you know, about the departmental activities and how he was glad that he was able to uh, finally get email working on his iPad and follow you know, everything that was going on in the department. He went to every single seminar of every prospective faculty member that we have considered, which often made me guilty of missing, for example, a talk of a theoretical uh, prospective faculty candidate at times. That's how he was, I guess. Um, and um, I think I'm very fortunate um, uh, to uh, have had Greg in my life and, and this memory will stay with me forever and I will miss him, his passion, his charisma, his stories and his great sense of humor. To lay me down once more, to lay me down with my head in sparkling clover. Let the world go by All lost in dreaming To lay me down one last time To lay me down To be with you once more, to be with you. With our bodies so close together. Let the world go by Like clouds are streaming To lay me down One last time
to lay me down to lay me down to lay me down one last time to lay I'm honored to be part of this service and in particular to help represent the family of undergraduates that matriculated through Greg's research laboratory through the years and also those that took his lecture courses and were advised by him on so many fronts uh, as part of this wonderful college. I graduated from the University of Chicago in 1993 and I spent two and a half formative years immersed within the Hill House research group and those of us that have been in the Hill House group know what immersed uh, fully means. Um, while I was sufficiently interested in science by then that just about any lab would have captured my interest to an extent, uh, irrespective of field, frankly, uh, the environment that Greg provided me within his lab created and cemented in me a deep desire to pursue an academic research career in his and now my own field uh, called inorganic synthesis. It was for me what made my choice to attend the University of Chicago and the hard work it demanded of its chemistry majors completely worthwhile. Greg's interest in my professional development extended into all areas of my undergraduate education and well beyond. I remember with fondness the excitement I experienced the first time I prepared a brand new molecule in his laboratory with then graduate student Don Yun and the many hours I spent with him and his then close friend and colleague, the late Professor Jeremy Burdett, trying to sort out its theoretical underpinnings. For those of you interested, that molecule was chromium bistriphenylphosphine dicarbonyl hydride nitrosyl. <laughs> I remember with amused fondness our softball team and how when I first knocked on Greg's door, after having been turned down by several other faculty for an undergraduate research position, Greg just looked at me and I asked, well, do you have any space this summer? And he said, well, do you play softball? Fortunately, I did. I remember our group camping trips with the Lynn and Wolf Labs that were so much fun. I remember lunchtime burger runs to Sammy's, which I now understand has closed uh, having to face the knowledge that its uh, favorite customer is no longer with us. I remember so much more. For example, I recall how quickly Greg's jovial good nature would turn serious at group meetings he used to hold in his office. Group meetings where we labored at his chalkboard, working through the steps of a reaction mechanism or counting valence electrons using the then infamous Hill House rules for empirical electron counting. While he sat there kicking back in what we called the captain's chair, sometimes eyeing us with his disapproving stare, twirling that tuft of hair that drooped down his forehead with his index finger, ever reminding us that we could and we should strive to do better. I recall Greg pulling an all-nighter with me. <clears throat> Understanding that I'd procrastinated, preparing <clears throat> a poster to present my research at an ACS meeting in San Francisco in 1992, the first one I attended, owing to the unfortunate timing of the loss of my grandmother. How many professors would do that? Would I? <laughs> I remember that first ACS meeting of mine, how, Greg, how many people Greg introduced me, uh, introduced me to there, dragging them to my poster, a couple that are here today. Uh, dragging me to dinners and, and, and opening my born and bred Chicago eyes to a much, much bigger world that was out there. Indeed, I didn't come to college with such an open mind. Uh, my mind opened because of college, and there was no one more instrumental to that for me. 
than Greg in the arc of my life since I met Greg some 24 years ago. Excuse me. I can draw many lines, ones now that lead to my wife and my son. And they all seem to find Greg, my dear, dear friend and mentor, at their origin. Greg's taught us all so many, many things. I'd like to acknowledge one other topic that he taught me. It's by now no secret, though it's not often said, that Greg lived what we, uh, we sometimes call an alternative lifestyle. It was a secret uh, to some extent, to a large extent, when I first met him uh, around 1990. Uh, he had joined this wonderful university, but a university that was nonetheless a conservative bastion of the physical sciences, which to this day tends to still be a realm that's fairly conservative in terms of uh, the makeup of the people you'll see in the physical sciences. And Greg had grown up in a more conservative time in a more conservative place, a time when being who he was in all its wonderful, fascinating parts just wasn't uh, so easy. I really didn't know what any of that meant when I first joined Greg's lab as a sophomore in college. <clears throat> but through his friendship, his wonderful sense of humor, and his gradual courage in beginning to take the risk of letting his closer friends and colleagues, and ultimately so many of us, in on this part of his life, I, and I suspect many of us, found the ability to grow as people. Greg's final lesson to me came from the crash course he offered all of us this past spring. I had never lost a personal friend, a personal close friend before this time. And Greg has taught me how to face and endure that. Indeed, he had prepared me well by showing me how he had dealt with the loss of some of his own close friends through the years that I knew him. He responded by helping them, by generously always helping others, and by accepting what fate was to come, including his own, while sharing fond and fun memories to the end. Greg Ever the Professor reminds us at the conclusion of this course we've all taken from him to touch as many lives as we can while we're here. It's really all that counts. And he touched so many, many lives in the time he, he was here. Boy, we'll miss him. That's tough to follow. <laughs> um, really, uh, you know, it's interesting today listening to the music um, that's you know being played. Um, I think that the Saturday after Greg passed, I basic, I'm basically a self-taught musician, and I sat there playing Grateful Dead on my mandolin for and enjoying beverages for maybe five or six hours straight, and uh, I played broke down palace for an hour and my uh, kids I heard my kids from their room say dad please stop <laughs> and so I guess there's just no accounting for taste musical taste of kids these days um, so I was uh, fortunate to meet Greg um, you know Greg and I for some reason never went to a Grateful Dead concert and Jerry basically died on us um, but I met Greg in, in uh, 1986 as a pr prospective student. I came and I remember going to his apartment um, and meeting him and he's wearing a, a pair of faded jeans and a and a Rolling Stones, it's only rock and roll t-shirt that was tattered and torn. And I had actually shown up fairly overdressed. Uh, <laughs> and I, I quickly uh, dressed down. Uh, and after my visit here, uh, I basically knew it was the first place I'd visited for, for prospective graduate schools that this was the person that I wanted to learn from. Um, it, there, there was just no question. Um, and so you know, I, I matriculated here in that fall and at the time Greg's group was pretty small. Alan Vaughn was actually the first student. I was the second student. I joined his group and I remember you know, sort of the scuttlebutt from amongst the students and they basically overheard someone saying, you're making a big mistake. And I think looking back on that, I, you know, I find it to be actually pretty ironic. Um, it was, uh, you know, probably the best decision I ever made. I, I learned a tremendous amount from Greg. And I think that um, 
you know, they, you know, several folks have talked about his role as a mentor, and you know, Greg actually uh, was, you know, he's a good friend and treated everyone differently. For some reason, I was the only person that didn't have a nickname. He actually insisted on calling me Milton, which is my given name, which I never go by. Um, and I was an assistant professor at Michigan State, and I was in about my third year, and I was really going through some pretty tough personal times, and I was, you know, I had things that I wanted, that I was interested in pursuing, and at the time, a lot of people, you know, I was getting a lot of questions about why is this important, why is this important, and I remember talking to Greg, um, yeah, and I was really at a pretty, pretty much at a low point talking to him on the phone, and, you know, I was laying this out, and he goes, Milton? As you know, I'm transparently honest. And he said, at your stage of your career, you're a better chemist than I was. Which, maybe he wasn't always transparently honest. <laughs> uh, but he said, what you need to do is whatever you think you want to do. You decide what you're going to do and what you're going to be. And, you know, at that time, that was really the best advice you know, I could have gotten. And it really it really uh, galvanized me to, to, to move forward. And I simply just wouldn't be able to have done what I've been able to do or, or influence the students I have without, without Greg. And I think when, when Greg had passed, I posted something on Facebook that basically said that, you know, Greg was a, a tremendous uh, teacher, mentor, and friend. And it's, you know, it's hard to be actually great at any one of those, and Greg was actually a master at all of them, um, and that you never felt shortchanged with Greg. You knew that you were getting everything from him that you could get. Uh, but the thing was that, you know, Greg wasn't done, and the thing that I think that's really the important thing, and I think, it, you know, I, I'm really excited about this, this fund that's being that'll be a legacy for, for, for undergraduates. And I think everyone that he's touched, I think, will go on, you know, it's really the thing for everyone to do is to go forward and, and try to live up to the standards, the incredible standards that Greg set. Thanks. For those of you that don't know me, I am, was the last postdoc in the Hill House group. And uh, many people here have talked about how Greg lived his life. And uh, I wanted to take a couple moments to tell you about a little bit more about how he ended it. Uh, Greg handled the end of his life much the same way he handled the rest of it. And I think he really demonstrated what kind of man he was in his last few days. Uh, when Greg got his diagnosis at the end of January, he took that time to have individual meetings with each member of his research group. And he told us his his plans for the next coming months. He told us to plan on him not being here four months down the road. Uh, as it turned out, that uh, was a bit optimistic. But he, he told me his plans for the coming months. He wanted to write papers. He wanted to make his, sure as much of his students' research got published as he could in the time he had left. And that was Greg in a nutshell. Uh, Greg might have chosen to wallow in self-pity, he might have chosen to spend his time sampling his very extensive and very good wine collection. Uh, instead, he chose to spend the little time he had left in the service of others. He chose to, to, you know, to selflessly devote himself to the benefit of others. And that was really a key feature of Greg's life whether it be his work with the terminally ill or the many and various university tasks he performed well beyond what could ever be expected or required of him. Greg devoted himself to others. And as the uh, people here who were, in the, who were in the Hill House group will tell you, you might have spent a couple of years in the Hill House group, but your membership lasted a lifetime. And the key to that membership is Greg never stopped trying to help you. When, when Greg talked to me about my future back in January, I told him not to worry about me, 
I, I was a postdoc already looking for a job, which I now have, and that I'd survive. And he scoffed at me and said I deserved to do more than just survive. And that too exemplified Greg. Gregory Hillhouse didn't survive 59 years. He lived 59 years. And he wanted each of us to live, 50, live as well. Mere survival wasn't enough for Greg. Life was meant to be lived, and I always remember Greg as a man who lived his life and used what time he had to serve others. And for that, I thank you, Greg. For those of you that don't know, I'm Ryan Witzke, and this is Tabitha Bohack. We're the leaders of Benzene, the Undergraduate Chemistry Club. Um, we're here to talk to you all today about Professor Hillhouse's remarkable interest in the lives and well-being of undergraduates here. This interest resulted in him making significant and lasting impact both on the lives of students as well as on the campus as a whole. He loved to see students embrace their passion for science and would go to great lengths to ensure that they were provided with many opportunities to support their interests. He was the driving force behind starting our annual benzene lecture, which was just fittingly renamed the Gregory Hillhouse Memorial Lecture. And this lectureship allows undergraduates to have the unique opportunity to invite um, distinguished scientists to campus and have a chance to meet and interact with, with them. Professor Hillhouse was also the undergrad chemistry advisor. He was always helping students with anything and everything they needed. He would help them find labs to work in or help them on their way, way to grad school or whatever other career path they chose. I remember going to his office as a freshman, confused and unclear on what classes I should take, and him sitting me down and figuring out all the classes for the rest of my college career. Additionally, like we already touched on today, Professor Hillhouse's love for teaching was inspiring. He was always available for students that you could just come to his office, ask him whatever you needed. Um, his passion for students was even more evident this winter, as Professor Hopkins touched on, when he, he continued teaching even after receiving his diagnosis, all the way up until he was no longer phys physically able to. Nearly three years ago, I joined Professor Hillhouse's lab. And this was easily one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life, even if it was mostly by accident and luck. It turned out to be very lucky. Um, he was a fantastic mentor, and he was always eager to talk to me about my research. Besides helping me develop my lab skills, he was also a very good friend. And as a group, we would, we would go to Cub ga Cubs games or restaurants, um, and we always knew that whenever we were with Hill House, everyone was going to have a great time. Not only did Hillhouse follow his Chicago Cubs, but he also took a deep interest in U Chicago athletics. I frequently saw him cheering on our baseball teams and our basketball teams, and he would always ask me how my season with the softball team was going, and encourage me before our big games. And as we already heard, Professor Hillhouse was a pretty legit softball player himself. We both had the privilege to play slow pitch with him on Team Beer, and we just remember watching hit after hit right over the third baseman's head, just out of reach as well as anyone who had, was able to play with him remembers his nasty pitching and just making every hitter look silly. If there's one thing that we learned from Hill House during the time that we knew him, it's that life should be lived to the fullest. He put his all into everything that he did in life, whether it was his research, the success of his students, his friendships, or his many other interests. In return for all of that effort, he was repaid with a full and satisfi satisfying life both for himself and for all of those around him. Thanks. At the close of the ceremony, again, you're warmly invited to the Quad Club for the reception. I hope that many of you will be able to be there and to share more of those stories. With our words and with our music, we give thanks for every memory of Greg. Greg Hillhouse, we say to you, we honor you for the countless ways you have enriched our lives and for the greatness of your spirit, your scholarship, 
your athleticism, your artistry, your many loyalties, your love of life. We entrust you back to the molecules of the universe from which you came, your head laid down with the divine presence which you loved, and we pray love still. May flights of angels sing you to your rest.